Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. This is uh, the continuation of the Temple of Doom series. I believe this is part D, but I'll have to look it up. All right, in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist has his ministry, and he was the forerunner for the Messiah, prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And in Matthew 3.13, we read, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now John was baptizing for the remission of sins. And what was baptism? It was basically the washing of the flesh. It was symbolic of cleaning your, well, you know, cleaning your body. But it was symbolic of us washing ourselves clean from sin. Uh, I believe it was Paul that said the washing of the water of the word. So you just don't want your body washed. You want your soul and spirit washed clean. And that's what basically it was representative of. So, all right, so... Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh, comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, or allowed him. Now, you got to realize, 1 Timothy 3.16, it says that God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was God in the flesh. And many of the things that he did were as an example unto us. Did Jesus need to be baptized for sin? No, absolutely not. Hebrews said that uh, he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. You see, if Jesus had sin, well, then we need a new Messiah, you know, the ones that the, uh, the, the, the Jews are looking for. Yeah, you can follow that one if you want, but um, no thank you, as for me. So he was an example unto us when it came to being, you know, baptized and praying to the Father and those kind of things. He was an example. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now those of you that have listened to the previous studies on Temple of Doom know that uh, there were some events uh, when his father Zacharias was uh, couldn't speak you know and everybody was looking at wondering well what kind of child is this and then Christ when he was a, a child you know you had the shepherds that came to him in the manger and uh, the wise men and you know you had uh, when Christ was 12, he was asking questions and listening to the doctors of the law. So people in the know were keeping their eyes out on John and Jesus. And of course, John always told everybody, he must increase and I must decrease. All right, so let's go to... Matthew chapter verse, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. So right after the baptism, 
the Holy Spirit descending upon him and the voice from heaven. We read Matthew 4, 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And why? Now remember, Christ was and is our example. What do you do when you go to the wilderness? Well, you don't have distractions, right? So when you go to Vegas, now I've been to Vegas uh, at least once that I remember. I was actually working there. I didn't go there to gamble or to visit prostitutes, the Mustang Ranch, or uh, any of those kind of things. Um, and when I made a, I made a delivery there. So, you know, what happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas, unless of course they repackaged it and, you know, sent mailed it out. I don't know. But uh, when you go to Vegas, you got all these flashing lights and all these things going on, and you got these shows. Uh, you got all these distractions. But where did go Jesus go? He was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. And what's in the wilderness? Well, just birds and animals and bugs and trees, right? Or if, unless you're in the desert. There's no distractions. It's just you and the Lord. You don't have all that filth from Vegas. Verse 2. And when he, Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. 40 days and 40 nights. Hmm, where have we read that before? Oh, wait, yeah. The flood of Noah, where God baptized the earth, right? Oh, yeah. God baptized the earth in the flood of Noah. He cleansed it, right? Verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Ah. So you think you're the Son of God, huh? Well, why don't you prove it to me? Turn these stones into bread. Um, you know, after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating, I imagine he was probably hungry, you know? But he answered and said, It is written, you know what? When the devil tempts you, that's what you need to be doing. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, after spending 40 days alone in the wilderness, communing with the Lord, the devil comes, and where does the devil take him? To the temple. Huh. Why the temple? Well, the temple was the center of worship, or was supposed to be the center of worship. And then he says, oh yeah, you're the son of God? Well, cast yourself down. Oh, they don't worry about it. The angels are going to catch you, right? Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, which probably paled in comparison to coming down from heaven, right? Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So, the devil took him to the temple, told him to throw himself down. I wonder if that was symbolic of when Satan was cast down from heaven for his rebellion, for the war in heaven. 
But, of course, Christ isn't going to fall for that, right? All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Next time you uh, catch a Hebrew roots person, you can show them this, where Jesus, uh, according to the you-know-whos, broke the Sabbath. So let's read about this. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, You know what? This is the thing. The Pharisees were following Jesus and the disciples, not because they wanted to learn, because they wanted to accuse. Oh yeah, you're you're doing that which is wrong. You're you're you got it all wrong, Jesus. But when the, the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. But he, Jesus, said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hungered, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, and are blameless? That's right. The priests of God on the Sabbath day worked. They did God's work on the Sabbath day. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. That's a pretty bold statement right there that in this place is one greater than the temple. And who is Jesus talking about? If you think he's talking about Peter, uh, you got it all wrong. Okay? That in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was part of thence, he went into the synagogue. Now, of course, you can keep reading, and you know, Jesus healed the man that had a withered hand on the Sabbath day. And then, uh, you know... They, uh, well, I guess we could read it. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, And is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? Instead of rejoicing that this guy got healed, and the glorious works of God, no, they want to accuse Jesus. One that is greater than the temple. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then said he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. He healed him, right? Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Oh yeah, nothing like religious people, you know? But this is a certain type of religious people that hang out in the synagogues. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem... And were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into a village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. 
All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Now, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, a guy that knew over 20 different languages fluently, including Biblical Greek and Biblical Hebrew. Hosanna, a Hebrew, it's a noun. It means basically save or I beseech you. An exclamation of praise to God or an invocation of blessing. In the Hebrew ceremonies, it was a prayer rehearsed on the several days of the Feast of Tabernacles in which the word was often repeated. So, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Verse 11. And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Ah, here's one of my favorite verses. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables, the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Yes, you know, you'd have a, a, a gold or a silver coin that was Roman and, you know, they would say, oh, well, you got to pay your temp, you know, your thing for the temple, but you can't use that. That's got Caesar's image on it. You got to use a temple coin. And uh, who knows, maybe the Roman coin value was double or triple what the temple coin is, but you know the money changers, yeah, we got it. Oy vey, we got to change your currency. Such a deal. So, uh, yeah, the money changers. We need a Jesus today to cast out the money changers uh, in Washington, D.C., but... Uh, that's not going to come for a little while. So, remember the what would Jesus do craze? The WWJD? How about what did Jesus do? WDJD. What did Jesus do? Jesus went into the temple, cast out all them that sold and bought the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Oh, yeah, I love it. And said unto them, It is written, My house, my house, shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Sounds just like Washington, D.C., if you ask me. Or Brussels, if you're over in the EU. Or London, if you're UK. Um, boy, I'm terrible. I don't even know the... T uh, capital of Canada. Huh. I'm I'm terrible. Ottawa. Okay. I didn't know. I had to look that up. So, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. You know, it was supposed to be a house of prayer. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were sore displeased. Oh yeah, they were unhappy. Cry me a river, people. And said unto them, 
Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus say, saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, now remember something. The fig tree was the symbol of the nation of Judah. The fig tree was a figure of the nation of Judah, not Israel, Judah. So Jesus was hungry, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. That's right. There was a lot of leaves, but no fruit. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. There you have it, people. Hebrew roots, no fruit fruit you get the picture there's no fruit in hebrew roots there's no fruits let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever judaism is dead it's a heresy it denies the virgin birth the incarnation of god into human flesh it denies the sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a heresy. Why would anybody in their right mind want anything to do with Judaism? But if you want to be a Noahide, go right ahead. I'll see you at the white throne judgment. Well, if I'm there watching, I'm hoping I'm never at the white throne judgment being judged. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which, uh, this with which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And when he was come into the temple, he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, Oh, I love this. By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? So, who do you think you are? They're basically telling them. That's, that's the Bob translation. Who do you think you are? Verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Now remember, when Jesus was asking questions to the doctors when he was 12 years old and listening to their answers, when Jesus asks you a question, you're in trouble. I mean, it's either, yeah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which, if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven... He will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Oh, yeah. You know, when Jesus asks you a question, you're in trouble. You know, it's that double-edged sword, people. You know, the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth, it cuts both ways. If you say, yes, you're in trouble, if you say, no, you're in trouble. So, may as well speak the truth. All right, let's skip to Matthew 23. I guess we'll read the whole chapter here. Boy, this is a, 
you know, one day the King James Bible is going to be illegal. Why? Because chapter 23 of Matthew of among other places, but this is a this is a pretty harsh condemnation. You know, when Jesus came to this earth, did he condemn Caesar? No. Did he um uh, you know, you know, he he didn't condemn Rome. Who did he condemn? The leaders in the temple. The chief priests. That's who he condemned. You know, let Caesar do what Caesar does. He's a, a, a earthly ruler. Satan's god of this world. Caesar is doing Satan's bidding. But the people in the temple were supposed to be representing the Lord and doing his work. So who did Jesus condemn? Let's read. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now the scribes were the, they were the ones that copied the scriptures. Because back in them days, you didn't have a printing press to print Bibles with. You didn't have it. They had to hand copy everything. Now, that was a very laborious and detailed job. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do. In other words, when they tell you to do something, do it. But do not ye after their works. For they say, and do not. In other words, they talk the talk, but they do not walk the walk. Yeah, they'll tell you to do something, but they themselves, they won't do it. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, but all their works, they do for to be seen of men. Oh yeah. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. I'm sorry, and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. You know what rabbi means? Master. Yeah. So every time you uh, hear one of these Messianic Jews running around claiming to be a rabbi, they're right here going against what Christ said. Maybe they have another Messiah. I don't know. Think about it. Now, everybody will quote verse 9 for the Catholic Church. But verse 8, they won't dare tell a Messianic rabbi this. Uh-uh. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth. What do they call Catholic priests? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Really? And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humbleth him, humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. What's a Pharisee? A denomination of the Jews, right? And if you think the Pharisees don't exist today, they do. They just don't call themselves Pharisees anymore. Now they call themselves Orthodox, Hasidic. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Jesus isn't talking to the Romans here. 
for their evil? You know, Rome was responsible for killing a lot of people, constantly having war. But he, Jesus wasn't condemning them because they're not in the temple supposedly doing God's work. I mean, let's face it, Rome was doing the devil's work. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Huh, they put a roadblock for people trying to get into the kingdom of heaven. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer or allow, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Wow! Three breaths, and he's already said hypocrites three times. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Yeah, you cross the land and sea, and when you have made him a, a, a follower of yours, you make him twice the child of hell than you are. That's the Bob translation. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Good point. You know, these people are swearing by the temple, the house, supposed to be the house of God, and they say, oh, well, you, you know, if you swore by the temple, you don't have to keep your vow. But if you swear by the gold in the temple, then you'd have to keep your vow. You'd have to keep your promises. So they weren't, they didn't care about the things of God. They cared about the things of gold, the mammon of this world, their greed. And that's always how it's been, hasn't it? You know, they don't care about the things of God. They care about the things that the gold can buy and the things that gold can do. They don't care about the things of God. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Verse 18. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. All right, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Boy, he's using that hypocrite word a lot, huh? For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Judgment, mercy, and faith. And when he's talking about judgment, he's talking about the rich uh, lauding over the poor, in my opinion. And then you got mercy and faith. So Christ said, those that show mercy will be shown mercy and faith. But, uh, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, oh, no, no, we're not, you know, we don't want to talk about judgment, mercy, and faith. Let's talk about tithing. I, You know, has anything changed in uh, almost 2,000 years? No, nothing. I mean, you could go on television and watch the TBN or the 700 Prophets of Baal Club and hear them talking about tithing, right? Uh, klepto dollar, I mean, uh, klepto send me many a dollar. Yeah, thank you to uh, uh, Sacred Cow Tipper there who thanks somebody else for giving him that. Yeah, judgment, mercy, and faith. 
These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, yeah. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Wow, he keeps saying that hypocrites word, huh? For ye may clean the outside of the cup of the and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Oh, yeah. Thou blind Pharisees. Oh, it makes you want to go join the Hebrew roots, huh? Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, then the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Can somebody count up how many times Jesus said hypocrites? For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of of hell boy and you wonder why uh i keep telling everybody that uh, this is going to be banned banned hate speech one day verse 34 wherefore behold i send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes and some of them ye shall kill and crucify and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Archias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Huh. He traced their bloodline all the way back to Cain. Isn't that interesting? Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now remember, Mystery Babylon in Revelation was had said that she had killed the prophets. We can show you that in a second. Matter of fact, let's look at that now. Well, Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus speaking. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered the children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens together under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Verse 37 again. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Thou that killest the prophets. Mystery Babylon killed the prophets. Jerusalem killed the prophets. Uh, but that means Rome, right? Yeah, yeah, that means Rome, right. I don't think so. I believe Jesus. All right, let's go to the book of John chapter 2. Um, we covered a parallel account of this in Matthew, but John does a really better, more in-depth coverage of this, if you ask me. John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, you know what a scourge is? It's a whip. He made a whip of small cords. He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Yeah, I love this. Uh, and you wonder why they uh, wanted to get rid of this guy? Oh, yeah. Hey, this guy's cutting into our, uh, our money-making business here. We got to get rid of this guy, you know. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Yeah? What miracle are you going to show? Verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Ah. So in 70 AD, the you-know-whos made an insurrection against Rome, and the Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem, burned it, and the temple. Utterly, dis utter destruction. But what was interesting is Jesus in Matthew 24 warned his disciples and the people that when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, flee to the mountains. Well, the thing was, General Titus had one Roman legion, and he surrounded Jerusalem. But there was another army, another legion on the way. So what he did was is he pulled back his, his legion, giving the Christians that believed Jesus time to escape Jerusalem. But the Jews that didn't believe Jesus, well, they figured, oh, well, the Roman army left, we won. No. Then the second legion arrived, which doubled the number of forces that General Titus had under his command, and they then surrounded Jerusalem again, besieged it, invaded it, and totally destroyed it. So God made a way for the Christians that believed Jesus to escape and flee to the mountains, just like in Matthew 24. And then Jesus said that in Matthew 24, you could read, where Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another that would not be thrown down from the temple. And that was fulfilled in 70 AD. You see, Rome set fire to the temple, and all the gold that was in the temple melted and went into the cracks in between the stones. And of course, the soldiers deconstructed the temple and threw out every rock and scraped every little speck of gold they could from the rocks, put the gold in their pockets, threw the stones down, and the prophecy of Jesus came to fulfilled that every stone was cast down from the temple in Matthew 24. So what is the Wailing Wall? Well, you got a choice. Either Jesus was a liar or the Wailing Wall is not what the you-know-whos say it is. Personally, I believe Jesus. And uh, watch what they're doing at the Wailing Wall. They're moving their pelvis back and forth, back and forth, like they're doing something. Uh, watch videos on that sometime. Uh, get back with me. Tell me what you think they're doing. Ladies, 
guys. Uh, yeah. I don't even like to think about it, but, uh, you know, when people start looking at what they really believe, uh, Christianity starts making sense. But, you know what, uh, Christians have really been infiltrated, all the churches, so... So Jesus was saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. In verse 21, he said, but he spake of the temple of his body. Oh, yes. All right, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 27. Now, if you want to read the account of uh, what I just mentioned about the temple, being destroyed. You could read Matthew 24 by yourself. I've done a number of videos on that subject, so, you know, I don't want to do it all over again. Uh, you could hit my playlist or do the search button, uh, the search bar, you know, Matthew 24. Uh, so, but this is on the temple. Jesus is the temple of his body. And it's getting ready to happen right here. Matthew 27. Let's go to verse 35. And I've done a lot of stuff on the crucifixion of Christ. I did a whole couple, several studies on it, actually. All right, Matthew 27, 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, and the other, and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be mocking him the day that Christ returns in glory. Verse 41, Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If, if, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that darkness God had laid upon Christ all the sins of his people. Think about that. God had basically turned his back on sin. Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard this said, This man calleth for Elias, for Elijah. Oh yeah, Hebrew roots people. They didn't even understand what Jesus was saying. And you're going to tell me they understand Hebrew? I wonder about that. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. 
Now, the veil of the temple separated the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, only the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, from what I understand, once a year, and he had to make sure he had to offer blood. And there was a veil separating the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, from everybody else. But after Christ died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, from heaven to the earth. Oh, yeah. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. So after the third day, when Christ rose from the dead, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And I'm sure the you-know-who said, oh, they're zombies, let's kill them again, because what are they doing? You know, think about it, people. What did Christ do for the three days that he was dead? He said that, uh, well, I did a study on it, if anybody's interested. Uh, Christ went to Abraham's bosom, where all the Old Testament saints went. For three days and three nights, and he preached the gospel unto Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, Elijah, uh, Elias, uh, no, I'm sorry, Elisha, Jeremiah, all the Old Testament saints, Samson, all of them, all the prophets, all the 12 tribes, all of them, and told them, believe on me. And they're with Christ now, up in heaven, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies. That's where did Christ go for three days? You know, the Pharisees asked him to, for a sign. And he says, uh, your sign is going to be the sign of Jonas. For three days and three nights, I'll be the heart of the earth. Well, what did he do there? He preached. I did a whole study on it. Check it out if you're interested. You know, send me a note. I'll find it for you. So after the third day, these people came out of the graves after the resurrection and went into Jerusalem and appeared to many. How would you like to hear the stories that they were telling? Wow, people, I was dead and I was in Abraham's bosom. And Christ came and preached unto us. And then brought me back to life and he's went back to heaven to be with the father what kind of stories would they have told you know think about it verse 54 now when the centurion and they that were with him watching jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done they feared greatly saying truly this was the son of god you know what? The Roman centurions, the soldiers, even knew truly this was the Son of God. But the but the, the chief priests, they didn't get it. Oh yeah. All right, so basically, Jesus is the temple. He's our high priest. He's our prophet. He's the king. He fulfills all these offices. Uh, click on my name, and you'll go to the home page, and you'll see playlists. I do. I did a whole study on who is Jesus, where I cover all the different offices that Jesus had. I mean, let's face it. He's our high priest. You know, Jesus said, "It is finished." when he was crucified. It is finished. Died for his peop the sins of his people. So, this is probably, I guess I'm going to close this out right now, and we will go and do one more, at least, one more study about the temple. 
not a temple built with hands, but the temple built without hands. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him. In Jesus' name, amen.